All right, excellent. So as Tom said, uh, we have a, a full day. Um, and as you can see, I haven't taken a shot of this shaking uh, thing uh, on the computer, but don't worry, uh, Matt's going to use uh, his own computer. So uh, we have a full day today, uh, and I'd like to introduce to you uh, uh, several uh, amazing people who are working as part of uh, Thrust 2 uh, in, in, in CBMA. And um, our sure goal is to try to understand uh, neurons and circuits of neurons and how they implement specific act, uh, aspects of uh, intelligence. So we, uh, as you'll see throughout the day today, we have uh, an amazing opportunity to, to pick inside the brain, to record from neurons, to record from circuits of neurons, and begin to understand uh, specific uh, aspects of the mechanisms that instantiate uh, computation. So for a lot of the uh, type of problems that we've been discussing over the last uh, several days, we know that there's one machine that can solve uh, those problems, which is uh, our brains. And the notion is that if we can uh, understand the biological circuits and mechanisms that give rise to uh, answering questions such as what's there, uh, where am I, uh, what happened before, what will happen next, and, and, and so on, uh, we will be able to translate those biological ideas into, into our group. So, so neurons and, and circuits of neurons can, uh, on the one hand, constrain uh, and inform our computational models, uh, but also vice versa. We can take ideas from computational models and now begin to evaluate some of those ideas uh, at unprecedented uh, resolution, as you will see from some of the uh, so I'm not going to be the presentation uh, myself. I do want to show just uh, one slide because this is not something that will be represented uh, today from work that I already alluded to briefly on, on Monday where uh, one of the possibilities that we have is to record invasively from the human brain in patients that have uh, uh, epilepsy. So uh, our lab is very interested in, in like, like many of you, in building computational models. And we are also need to be very in the opportunity of recording from the human brain and therefore bridging some of the questions that are asked in some of the other thrusts to, to some of the mechanistic understanding that we can derive from uh, recordings in animal models. So very quickly, this is a recording from a neuron uh, in, in entorhinal cortex. This is a patient that has electrodes implanted for clinical reasons. And this is a neuron that has uh, a, a significant uh, degree of selectivity to certain pictures but not others. These are raster plots. Each of these plots is an action potential uh, obtained after spike sorting uh, uh, data from, uh, from recordings in which a patient is shown uh, a series of uh, uh, images. And you see that there's an elevation activity for one particular category of stimuli with respect to others. In other cases, we record field potential, so this is the infrared field potential as a function of time, and each of these colors also corresponds to a different category of stimulus. So we can get uh, selective responses from recordings in the human brain, and this may potentially provide us with a bridge to understand uh, how uh, uh, our understanding, our mechanistic understanding coming from animal models uh, can relate to some of the work in the other approach. I'm not going to say any more if anyone is interested. I'd be happy to talk more about this recording. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, 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 an amazing person in Thrush 2, uh, Matt Wilson, who's been uh, doing beautiful work uh, uh, studying uh, recordings in the hippocampus as well as interactions with, uh, with other areas in, in products. Great. Thanks, Jerbo. Um, you know, I was, when I was coming over here, I was just reflecting that uh, I think it was 28 years ago when I first came to NBL and uh, was a TA like our illustrious TAs back there, in uh, a new course that was uh, being started, the uh, Methods of Computational Neuroscience course that uh, Jim Bauer was talking about at the time. So it was a time where, you know, it was, it was models, it was, it was neurons, it was developing uh, ideas, theories, and hopefully uh, inspiring the next generation of neuroscience. And uh, I made a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues, people that I know today, uh, and we still remember those, uh, the time we had here at MBL. Uh, I was just uh, I was just talking with Gabrielle. I don't know if they, they still allow you to build bonfires on the beach, but uh, if they do, I highly recommend. <laughs> so with that, uh, I would like to try to give you an overview of the of, uh, work that we do in the hippocampus, uh, but not just in a, I mean, it will be largely descriptive, but what I hope to try to convey is the sense that the, the current methods that we're using combined with computational perspectives can give us some insight into uh, the nature of computation that might be embedded in neural circuits as evidenced by the dynamics of information as it's expressed in the system. So being able to monitor um, activity in the brain, see how it evolves, uh, look 
at the interaction between different brain areas and give us some sense of how information that encode is encoded, how it's actually used and transformed in the service of memory and cognition. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to highlight two uh, two two and a half uh, brain states. There'll be the awake state and the sleep state. During wakefulness, we can think of wake, wakefulness as uh, being broken down into active engagement, where we're perceiving, we're taking in information, and then introspective reflection, where we're evaluating, planning, or uh, preparing to interact with the world based upon previous information. And we can interrogate the brains of rats. If we have a pointer. Uh, oh, here we go. So we integrate the brains of rats. Here we see uh, the structure that I'm going to focus on, the hippocampus, shown in cross-sectional view in the rat. Here in cross-section, you see the classic trisynaptic circuit of the hippocampus. Information coming in from across the brain, uh, information about the world, perceptual information, associational information, converging on the adjacent structure, the entorhinal cortex. The stuff gets funneled into the hippocampus along uh, primary uh, afferent pathway, the perforant path making synaptic connections into the three primary subfields of the cancer, the dentate gyrus, area CA3, corner minus three, CA1, CA2 is in there as well. They didn't, they were, they were actually uh, adept at numbering, they didn't skip it. There is CA2. Uh, CA2 is an intermediate region, which is actually expanded in humans. It's one of the things that distinguishes it. It's something that has uh, grown disproportionately large in humans. It's relatively small in rodents. So we talk about what that uh, might mean evolutionarily, why would you add this little, why would you expand uh, this particular structure? Another comparable structure that has evolutionarily uh, expanded disproportionately is the prefrontal cortex. So if you think about expansion of prefrontal structures and an intermediate uh, 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 subfield of CA2, with some computational insights. Uh, then area CA1, and then the subiculum. So I'm going to talk about recordings that have been made in this field, subfield, er subfield CA1 of the hippocampus. And uh, the re reason for this is really threefold. Um, the first reason, the best reason, is see it's right there on top, which means it's easy to get to. It's, it's accessible. Um, uh, a slightly less practical uh, reason is that it's on the output side of the hippocampus. And as we think about this uh, circuit, forming a loop in which input comes in, again, from the entorhinal cortex, then moves from the dentate, synapsing on dentate gyrus, dentate gyrus synapsing on CA3, CA3 on CA1, then CA1 back up to the subiculum. Now you might say, oh, why don't you, why don't you look at the subiculum and subiculum the actual output of the campus? And the answer to that is, yes, it is. And it would, in fact, be one of the, uh, uh, one of the preferred targets. It's just that it's harder to report from. And as we can talk about some of the properties, as the electrophysiological properties of neurons in the subiculum in area CA1 differ such that when we talk about the techniques that I'm going to show you, uh, getting good isolation from individual cells is simply more difficult in the subiculum. So what you get a sense of already, and I think uh, this would be confirmed by you know, the people during neurophysiology, is that uh, the data and the approach that we use is a combination of uh, two things. One is sort of the pragmatics of doing the recordings. You go where the structures are accessible, but also informed by <laughs> functional assessing. And is, it, uh, is it an interesting region? And one of the reasons this region uh, uh, became interesting was in the uh, early 1970s when John O'Keefe, uh, working at uh, UCL, uh, dropped electrodes into the hippocampus for recording from individual cells in this accessible part of the, of the dorsal of the campus rodents. And what he observed was that individual neurons had these receptive fields as they fired preferentially uh, based on the location of the animal. An animal walking around a little table like this, as the animal walked around, when he would go to certain locations, different cells would fire. So different cells had different places that they preferred to respond to. Different cells, different places. He termed cells, place cells, and the regions of, uh, of space that they fired in place fields. So in the early 1970s, John O'Keefe discovered place fields in 
area C of one of the campus. Previous to that, there had been uh, there had been more cognitive work, cognitive neuros, uh, uh, neuro neuropsychological work, which had demonstrated the involvement of the campus in all forms of memory in rodents and uh, most uh, notably in autobiographical or episodic memory, event memory in humans, in the seminal case of the patient, HM, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, damage to the campus produced uh, an irreversible uh, loss, anterior, anterior grade loss in the ability to form the memories. It also produced a partial retrograde loss in memory. Old memories were lost, but interestingly, really old memories or remote memories seem to be preserved. So you need to dip the campus, form new memories. You also needed it to access relatively recent past memories. Really remote memories seem to be intact, suggesting there was some kind of transformation of memory, of information, requiring the hippocampus uh, over time. And so we'll talk about all of these issues, encoding of information, the immediate processing of information, and then the mechanisms that might contribute to the long-term transformation or consolidation of information. So dropping the electrodes into CA1, John O'Keefe discovered uh, play cells, but uh, the idea of play cells, individual cells responding to stimuli in the world. And so it's a concept, we think of visual receptive fields, we think about perceptual receptive fields in general as the brain represents information uh, as it exists in the world. But information in the world does not exist in a static form. It changes over time. Let's say the one imperative of the brain, organisms interacting with the world, an unpredictable world, is in fact to make rational predictions about the future given in incomplete knowledge. And so how does the how does the brain operate to both draw inferences from past experience and to extrapolate or make predictions or estimations of future state? In order to do that, they have to build uh, some kind of internal model which carries information about causal interactions. A came before B, maybe A caused B, so if I see A, maybe B is going to happen, something like that. And that kind of causal inference requires that you actually maintain not only state information, but the kind of state transitional information, the probability that if I'm in state A, I get to state B, something that I can infer causality, something about time. So we need, in some way, at least to appreciate the time order in which events have occurred, and then hopefully be able to capture and then exploit that in, at some later point. So one working hypothesis is that uh, experience, processing experience, and forming memories of experience involves time. That is linkage of states. In the case of the rodent, these states are spatial locations. And damage to hippocampus and rodents produces impairments in spatial navigation, as it does in humans. If I were to go in lesion your hippocampus, uh, you would not only have difficulty in remembering what you did last week, but you would have difficulty remembering where you parked your car or where the bathroom was, or basically being able to uh, move around that game in the world. So something linking experience and spatial navigation, a working hypothesis is that this kind of temporal linkage might be a, a common computation or common computational imperative that the hippocampus satisfies the need to keep track of things in time. So the methodology, this is just a device that allows uh, the insertion of fine microwires, uh, this microdrive array would be implanted on an animal's head, make a little hole, place this on top, cement the thing on top, and now the animal's got a, a permanent uh, uh, interface or crown, allows us both to advance microwires and then take signals off over uh, well, indefinite periods of time. So this is a chronic permanent implant, which gives us access to neural activity in the vicinity of these electrodes. Now, that some technical details. In this case, you see the electrodes depicted as uh, a, a tight bundle for microwires. Uh, the principle here is just one of uh, spatial triangulation based upon the spatial attenuation electric fields generated by individual cells as they produce these actual potential events. So currents flowing in neurons, those currents produce fields. The fields can be detected by these electrodes, and the relative amplitude of the of the field can be used to infer the distance of the recording surface from the source. Based on that distance, kind of convert that, and you can figure out or at least estimate the localization or the relative 
uh, location of the sources. Different locations of sources you attribute to different neurons. So we typically refer to these things as units. Units, but we don't really, they're sort of units, <laughs> units of signal generating capacity. These individual units could be neurons, but as we've gained uh, deeper insight into the detailed cellular functioning uh, of these more complicated units that we call neurons, uh, what we realize is that different compartments of neurons can function in a very similar capacity. Dendrites themselves have the same action potential generative capabilities and can independently produce these sorts of action potential events independently from SOMA. So you have to think about this as, uh, as Christoph Koch and Tommy Poggio, who is he's back here, uh, had done many years back. This was before the, that first uh, Methods in Computational Neuroscience course. It was a part of the inspiration for that, the idea that neurons themselves can perform computations and these logical computations can then be embedded within larger networks. So you have networks within networks. Thinking about how neural computation uh, is implemented potentially give us some novel insight in how the brain actually exploits that. So uh, we can talk about that a little bit. I, you know, I'm gonna I, I, I'll give my talk. I have I, I've limited the number of slides because I want to encourage more discussion. I tend to talk a long time anyway, as largely because I go off them on a little tangents. Uh, and so. I just throw these things out here. These are like little hooks, little tangent hooks that you should feel free to grab onto and come back to at any point. So thinking about the nature of dendritic computation in the integration. And uh, you know, I don't know if it's worth, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna point it out anyway. <laughs> so when you think about these if you think about the neurons and you just think about them as having you know, they have dendrites, they have synapses, and the synapses serve to just take in information and integrate. You just kind of summate. You have some, you know, you'll have some weight matrix. You'll, you know, you'll sum these sort of discrete events by their weight. You add them up, and that's the output of neuron. But uh, of course, those inputs are spatially distributed along the neuron. And one thing, this is, uh, and you see this uh, as a very general principle of organization, and that is that inputs coming from different sources will tend to be segregated in different regions of the dendrite, such that uh, you know, inputs coming from, in the, let's say, the adjacent subfield, area CA3 into, into the CA1, those will tend to terminate here in a particular region of the dendrite, a little sort of proximal to the cell body. The inputs coming from a little farther away, the enteromal cortex, they come a little bit further away. And so there's a mapping, general mapping, let's see, distance from the both kind of anatomical and I think of potentially computational distance, the equivalence of representation, is mapped onto distance along and so you can think about what kind of computation might uh, necessitate segregation of these inputs so that you could potentially manipulate them independently. One thing that allows is again these kind of local interactions. You can have local nonlinear interactions, you can amplify, you can perform computations on cell similar inputs. By segregating them, you can independently uh, part partition them off. You can gate off different different inputs. And as I'll mention, when we hopefully finally get to it, activity in uh, these output structures like CA1 uh, is modulated in time, so there's a dynamic to it. So the activity changes over time. And one thing that one sees is that the presence of these dynamics, which are often manifest in terms of oscillation. So you have oscillate, brain oscillations. Brain oscillations allow you to do two things. One, is they allow you to establish some kind of coordinated timing, as you can, uh, you can use it as a clock to coordinate the timing of interactions. Uh, so you have uh, frequency, which you can lock, but you can also shift the relative timing through phase. So frequency and phase, so you can lock in frequency, you can shift in phase. One thing that you find is that the inputs that come in not only come from different places, not only are those places organized differentially along the dendritic tree, but in the hippocampus in particular, and we can discuss as well in other structures, they come into different phases. So the relative timing shifted in a systematic, systematic fashion. 
So you can think about this inputs coming in different places, at you know, different regions of the dendrite, different sources coming in at different relative phases with respect to the output. And uh, when I get to it, I might mention that we've done manipulations trying to influence using techniques that Boyden is going to highlight optogenetically, optogenetics. Optogenetic is manipulating activity at certain phases. We map into very discrete cognitive functions that can selectively impact, uh, uh, for instance, encoding and retrieval functions, simply fiddling around with activity at relative phases, different phases carry different computations. So, question. Um, for all that dendritic Thank you. stuff that you uh, were talking about, how specific is that to hippocampus? And do we know if that's kind of general for our cortex? Not specific hippocampus at all. In fact, you see this very elaborate in cortex. And of course, one of the one of the properties of cortex, distinct from the hippocampus, we refer to as isocortex because of its highly laminated structure. So you have multiple layers of cell bodies. The hippocampus is older cortex, archicortex, and that is only has one cell, well, has one prominent cell body layer, and then, so the, there are, there have been proposals, uh, uh, John Allman being the most notable, to sort of postulate evolutionarily these uh, isocortical, the isocortical elaboration is really, it's, it's just a sort of repetition of a theme that's already been manifest in the hippocampus, and as you just kind of double and fold over the hippocampus to get neocortex, isocort neocortex being isocortex. So, virtual associational you know, cortical areas have the same basic principles. Uh, another, I don't think we have anybody talking about the piriform cortex. I got started in the piriform cortex, olfactory cortex. Olfactory cortex, evolutionary, extremely old. You have, you know, organisms don't even have, uh, you know, other vertebrates that don't really have a neocortex. They have a tact. Uh, uh, olfactory cortex and hippocampus, these are evolutionary, evolutionarily very old. Olfactory cortex has an organization almost identical to the hippocampus. Same, you know, same organization of inputs, distant information, you know, inputs from the, you know, olfactory bulb and from different parts of the olfactory cortex terminating in different zones. And other interesting properties, if you look at the synaptic properties, modulation of transmission and plasticity also varies systematically. And that is that there are systematic interactions between different inputs. Neuromodulators will change the way synapses change and independently modulate transmission and plasticity. Uh, yeah. Oops. Another question. Um, when, 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 when people are talking about like subunits, like dendritic subunits, when they kind of have that kind of different nonlinear computations, like are these like kind of modular things? And if so, is there, is there like there are three modules, or like a hundred modules, or do people not really know? Um, well, I mean, yeah. So the extent to which dendrites can serve to modularize computation, certainly something that uh, has enjoyed a lot of uh, modeling effort. It's been empirically a little bit difficult to demonstrate, and that's just because, again, just like the campus, you kind of go where it's easy to go, and it's been difficult to get the kind of uh, measurements that will allow you to determine exactly what is the nature of interactions, how modular and how isolated are different dendritic compartments. I would think, I, I, I believe now uh, uh, the, the data and the thinking is for increasingly modularized dendritic uh, computation. Can you just elaborate on what, what that means? Like what is the... That it makes a difference whether... so. Synaptic contexts that are nearby, where nearby is determined based upon a, like a, a distance in dendritic space. How far are you from other inputs? And that uh, you can kind of think about that in terms of uh, like a sort of a cable theory formulation that it's, that it's, uh, you don't do any like any neural modeling or biophysics, but. If you just think about all, you know, the dendrites, the branches of dendrites is having some electrical distance. I put a current in one, or, you know, in, you know, uh, in one dendrite. There's going to be some resistance to traveling along paths depending upon the distance and the size of the, the dendrites themselves. And so you can think of that difficulty of resistance as, as partitioning space or segregating inputs such that, it's, uh, that in, uh, uh, an input, one point on the tree, it's going to have little influence on an input, another part of the term. And that proximity is therefore going to translate into some uh, you know, probability of interaction. But 
that that distance uh, can be spanned either by making things physically closer or making them electrically closer. That's how we can make them electrically closer, make it easier for currents to travel. One strategy that neurons employ in order to do that is they use nonlinear amplification, as you see here, evidence in the generation of action potentials. Oops. And that is that you, you know, rather than just require, you know, relying on sort of passive propagation, you actively amplify, and then that amplification allows you to get further. Just, you know, just so active amplification is something that's used uh, uh, as a communication strategy everywhere, including in uh, the dendritic tree. And so you can think of the expression of active properties in dendrites, nonlinear amplification dendrites, as indicating uh, a need or desire to increase, let's say, the modular size. You want everybody to be able to talk. It's like the distance, you know, the shortest distance, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, two degrees of separation in a active, you know, an active dendrite, maybe three or four, or a more passive dendrite. And so I mentioned one of the differences between CA1 and the next station down, the subiculum. The subiculum has much more active dendritic processing. That is that there's this kind of action, these, this bursting that goes on in cell bodies that we think of as associated. That's what neurons do. They integrate and they fire. Dendrites do the same thing in the subiculum, highly active. So the subiculum you can think of as, a, as, as more modularly integrated, less active processing, more modularly segregated, smaller modules, because you know, it's just harder to communicate with lungs. Do you mean that they actually have like, something like an axon helicky kind of thing where they have... Like so the same active conductances, these voltage-dependent potassium sodium channels, that allow action potentials to be generated in, for instance, the axon hilla, are present in the dendrites. The dendrites can generate action potentials. They can propagate action potentials from one point of the dendrite to the other to another point of the dendrite. And those propagated action potentials never have to make it down to the soma. Now, there are strategies for for uh, directing and throttling that communication. And one of those strategies is to strategically place inhibition along the dendrite. So this one thing that also rarely comes up, you think of inhibition as just a minus sign. It's just, a, it's just the converse of excitation, just something that complements excitation. But, but inhibition is organized strategically in a very different way. Inhibition, by and large, unless you go around and screw around with the genetics of uh, the organism, do not terminate on synaptic spines, and that if it's segregated from the inputs, the spine itself, you can think of as the sort of the finest modular uh, granularity. It is what allows single inputs, single synapses, uh, to be processed in modular. So inhibition tends to come in either at the base of spines or on the on on the, uh, primary dendritic shafts. That is, for instance, like here or adjacent to small dendrites. So. Inhibition has the ability to uh, potentially throttle or segregate or regulate the nature modular interaction. So, again, you can think of it, they're like, they're like traffic lights, green, red. You can direct traffic by regulating inhibition at strategic throttle points. And one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the most ubiquitous throttle points across all neurons is here, at the interface between the dendrite and the soma, and that is this sort of proximal region. This is where you find a whole class of inhibitory interneurons, the, uh, uh, the perisomatic inhibitory interneurons, which well, I might mention, um, which have, they've drawn a lot of attention, A, because they have these sort of very characteristic termination uh, profiles, that is, you have very powerful synapses kind of surround the cell body in particular, uh, this, they're, you know, the regions just at the base of these proximal dendrites. And the effect that they have is to create large conductance pathways that will effectively shunt out any, any excitatory current. So again, they have the ability to kind of throttle or to direct communication, allow lots of traffic to flow here to completely cut it off from here. It's like the, 
like the born bridge of uh, of neurons, right? So it's on the born bridge. Nobody's, you know, nobody's getting to the Cape. You know, because all of, you know, the rest of Massachusetts, nobody gets to the Cape, just one point. Uh, so this kind of strategic throttling point where he tells us that that there is very likely computation that requires that we segregate input processing and output processing and allow this kind of input processing to utilize the same mechanisms for you know, uh, bridging distances through carefully choreographed interactions. So what you see in networks, again, you see in, in dendrites, the segregated throttling interactions between different units. We're here, we're talking about units or cells connected by axons. Here we're talking about units which are dendritic modules separate, separated uh, and gated through inhibition in a similar fashion. That was pretty long. Segue. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, so here you see uh, an illustration of the raw data that would come from the detection of these action potential discharge events which are generated both from cell bodies but also can come from dendrites. So uh, this technique does not allow us to distinguish what the precise source is. It just lets, lets us say the location of the source differs. And so we're going to call these things different units. And if we now take those isolated units, action potentials generated from different spatially localized sources, and then we map their occurrence onto space and just accumulate that over time as an animal runs along a maze like this little track. It's about a two meter track. Animal gets food rewards at the one end at each end. So he's running back and forth along this track, back and forth. And here the color coding indicates the identity of the isolated unit. So the yellow unit all spikes came from one from one zone, one location in anatomical, nearby anatomical space. So we think of this as a camp cell. So it tends to fire here in this part of the maze. The red cell fires on this part of the track, in cell over here. So this is, again, the, this, this is just a demonstration of what John O'Keefe had discovered, spatial firing preference or place fields of these cells. And one thing about these cells, place cells, is that basically wherever you record in the hippocampus, you find cells that show this kind of spatial preference. And the estimates are that 95% that, that or better of the cell, the primary RAM principal cell to hit the campus, have some kind of spatial specificity. But at any given time, only about 3 to 5% of them are active. And this is consistent with a sort of a general estimate of sparsity. That is that at any given time, the campus is using about 3 to 5% of its available resources. Now, of course, the animal goes to different locations, it's a different 3 to 5%. And so overall, if you ask how many brain, how many hippocampal neurons are going to participate in the, I loosely call it representation, it's just the, you know, in activity associated with this, uh, with this experience or this maze, it's on the order of about 30%. It may differ 30 to 50%, but generally the campus is using about a third of all of its, all its neural capacity just for this one little track. To put it onto a different track like this, and it's gonna be another 30%. Not necessarily independent 30%, it's just like another random draw. You reach in into the hippocampal grab bag of neurons and you pull out, you know, pull out a handful of 30% of the neurons, you throw them out on the environment, that's what you get. Move to a different room, same thing, pull them out, throw them down wherever they land. So the distribution, the location, where this yellow cell fires, if I put this animal to a different track, is essentially independent from uh, the location of that septa field in this particular track. Are there games you can play by fiddling with the environment and you know essentially trying to create these cognitive conflicts? Make the tracks look the same, have the same sorts of things. Uh, so independence does not mean that they are net uh, that there isn't going to be any correlation between the firing if we make the environment themselves correlate. It's just that cells themselves, uh, left to their own devices, are trying to orthogonalize maximally orthogonalize representations across independent environments. There might be things that are shared, might show up similarity, but in general, 
you can't predict whether one cell is going to where one cell is going to fire by knowing where it fired somewhere else, and that two adjacent cells are not necessarily going to fire in a cell similar fashion. So anatomical location does not actually map onto uh, uh, similarity or equivalence of the receptive field problem. This is very different from other structures where you find representations that kind of map. They have a top. They have a topography. That it's that adjacency in stimulus or representational space, stimulus space, is mapped into similarity or adjacency in the representational space. Cells that are nearby in the somatosensory cortex will tend to respond to nearby locations uh, on the body surface. In fact, those nearby locations are not necessarily anatomical locations, but they could be functional. You know, the hand, the mouth can be nearby. The, point to the other adjacencies, you can figure out what those actually mean. But you know, the idea that they reflect that proximity or adjacency reflects some kind of uh, 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 some dimension of the computation, which is trying to extract some statistical regularity. That statistical regularity in very predictable uh, inputs like body surface, my body, your body, the bodies of generations to come, we're all going to have the same sort of statistical regularity. So why not embed it in the system? Why not embed it in the circuit? The big campus doesn't have those topographic regularities. And the reason is my experience, your experience, the experience of you know, generations to come, my experience tomorrow is unpredictable. Cannot, the the statistical, statistical regularities cannot be embedded in the circuit. They have to be inferred. And so the strategy is rather, rather than introduce a Systematic bias, which is going to be wrong. Systematic error is the worst kind of error. Better to just make random errors. And so that's what the hippocampus has done. It suggests, again, that it's trying to discover statistical regularities that are not manifest or obvious in uh, the inputs themselves. There's a question. Yeah. So once a given environment is learned, how constant is the representation of a certain area in, in a neuron? Right, so looking at the stability of that, that is that I take the animal out, I bring it back in, and I look at these patterns. What you'll find by and large is that the, that the cells will fire, the location of the place fields will remain constant. Now the precise firing rate, and that is the number of spikes that are emitted, that varies. That varies even over the time scale of seconds to minutes. So as we'll, you know, when we get to it, you can think of there actually being at least two basic representational dimensions. And this is a, you could think of this as a, again, a computational imperative if a campus has, as if I have to form memories of events, one thing is that events occur, I have to remember where they occur. When I come back to, I come back to Woods Hole, I think, oh, you know, MBL, I think of the course, I think of the beach, I think of all the, the locales, places where things happen. And so those places have not changed. 25 years, those places have not changed. I walk by cat and kids, same, everything's the same. There's some new little funky, I don't know what the heck, they're selling hats or something across the street. That was not there. I have no idea what's going on there. But that's, so I'm able to identify, let's say similarity equivalence, to recognize static context and, and, and deviations from that context. I can recognize those things. And those things don't change. But the experience, things that happen in there, my experience just going by the kid, very different from my experience, my remembered experience of things that happened to the kids. So I have to have these two things, constancy of the static contextual information, and I have to have uh, uh, non-stationary of the time varying in independent experiential information. So something's got to stay the same, something's got to change on a moment-to-moment -moment time scale. The thing that stays the same is where the cells fire. So the cells, the relative location, probability of a cell emitting spikes as a functional location, that stays constant. I bring this animal back in here, and it's been looked at over in a rat um, over a period of months. Bring the back rat in today, a week, a month, two months, three months, cells fire in the same location. But again, if you look at the, the number of spikes, so the firing rate, that fluctuates, and often it fluctuates in a very systematic fashion. And that is that over the course of, let's say, the, over the course of this 10-minute uh, um, uh, 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 training session, the firing rate of this cell might go from uh, a, a peak of maybe 10 spikes per second, which we'll see is consistent with an internal uh, rhythm that we have, to maybe five, so that there'll be, there'll be systematic shifts. You could think of those kind of drifting 
sort of drifting non-stationarity. And the drifting non-stationarity is interesting because of what it means is if you, were, if you looked at a vector, the vector itself, the components would be constant. Actual, the actual values would change, and they would change in a systematic way. So that you could even infer, if I looked at two, give me two vectors, I could look at the effective distance between them. It's like a measure of relative time. That is how far they might separate just based upon the, the relative variation of the, of the independent components. Question. Uh, you said about 30% of the neurons participate. Right. How does it scale with the size of the mass and can you put some capacity? It doesn't seem to scale in a significant... So if I take the animal and uh, the size of the place fields as well, so if I take an animal I, and, and I put it into a smaller version, a smaller environment, what you find is that you can still get roughly the same number of place cells. But what can change both the number and the relative independence of the firing is the way the animal behaves in that environment. And it's the more variable the behavior, that's the more segregated the fields become. And the clearest demonstration of that comes when you compare the activity of these cells and the animal is just wandering around. For instance, it's just, you know, it's in a, an environment, it's just wandering around versus an environment in which, like this, where it's following circumscribed paths. And that is, it's going through this, these locations in these two sequences. There's this sequence, and there's this sequence. And those two sequences are really independent. You can think of this, and you know, just topologically, you can fold this out. This is really, you know, it looks like a linear maze, you can think of it as a as kind of a large circle. This trajectory and this trajectory. For instance, here, this trajectory, this location on these two tra trajectories is actually as far, is, uh, these are the two farthest points. That is, they're the le least likely to co-occur. You can't take the, you know. And so when you look at these things, these cells not only fire as a function of location, but they become what people call it, directionally dependent. It's not only where the animal is, but the direction it's following. So, that, for instance, the green and the, and the blue cell, these things actually don't fire together, even though they look like they fire in the same space. The blue cell fires, in this case, when the animal's going on this outbound trajectory. The green cell fires when he's on the inbound trajectory. So those two things are separate. So you can estimate the behavior of an animal in a very large environment based on some kind of a capacity that you can hold by the... So you could, in fact, just by looking at, at patterns of activity, you can infer something about, A, the dimensionality of space, and something about complexity of behavior. In fact, I, you know, I took this out of the talk because I knew I was going to talk too long. But, uh, but we've actually done this, and so we published recently a paper, uh, this is with uh, one, of, uh, one of our former CBM, CBMM, Postdocs, Sage Chen, just got a position down at NYU. So he did this analysis. This is just doing an unbiased hidden Barkov model analysis of spiking activity size. I just give you all these spikes. I just give you this raw, just a, just a bunch of spikes from, you know, 100 neurons. You say, well, what does it mean? What do you say? <laughs> I mean, what does it mean? I don't know. It's just, it's just spikes. I don't tell you anything about, I don't tell you anything about this other than the animal is doing something. So what you can do is you just kind of walk through this. Now you just imagine it. Imagine you're a downstream unbiased observer. And all you know is that, that there's going to be some kind of consistency. There's going to be some relationship between where the animal is and what it's doing and the patterns that you see. So they're not random, which means there are patterns that are going to be recurring. It's sort of a, you know, it's a cryptographic exercise. There are patterns going to, that are going to recur, and those patterns are going to be constrained in some way by the topology of the space, and that is the, this, this is time-bearing component, the two patterns that are nearby one another probably are coming from states that were nearby each other in the world. So you just go through and say, okay, I'm just going to assume that this, you know, this, this, these spike trains were generated by some sort of hidden Markov-like model. I can describe using hidden Markov, so I go through, identify the states, I compute the transition probabilities between the various states, essentially do some kind of, some kind of dimensional reduction, compute the transitional matrix, look at the transitions, and then I, inf I can infer, I say, well, the actual dimensionality of this is much lower than I expected, because these states actually have some connectivity. You can infer, well, it comes from a one- or two-dimensional environment, whatever that is, one- or two-dimensional space in which they were generated, and you can go back in and then reconstruct everything. So just given this is what Sage did, just given raw spike trains, make this Markov assumption, you go back in, you identify the states, 
you reconstruct the place fields, and you can reconstruct the behavior with nothing. It's like your camera's broken. And so what it tells you is that, these, that the neurons are actually, they're capturing enough information that a blind observer just looking at the output of the hippocampus could figure out nature of the environment, could reconstruct the behavior, could make a lot of inferences about what's actually going on. So that's, so that's, that's kind of an important property because unless there's some kind of homunculus that we don't know about, brain areas are kind of on their own. They're, they need to be able to carry out the sort of blind inference based on, on activity and then perhaps some sort of prior assumption about structure. And that could be something about photography like the somatosensory areas. But here in the hippocampus, you don't have that. All you know is the things that are connected in time, that are nearby in time, likely came from states that are nearby, in this case, space. So that's the one, that's the assumption. So you map time into space, and then you figure out what is the space that would give you this kind of temporal trajectory among these states. Um, uh, just to make sure I understand. Are these play cells? Is this, can you get these with a mouse running through the names for the first time? Yes. And so we looked at the dynamics of that. And so you see that there's a big jump between the first time and the second time. So that second time, what you find is that the robustness of firing, where robustness is the consistency with which the cell emits the spikes as a function of location. And the consistency of the population. So if you look at the covariance across cells, so there's going to be, as I say, at any given time, like 3 to 5% of the cells. So there's 3 to 5% of the campal cells here. In the area CA1, there's maybe, you know, 100,000. 100, let's say there's 100,000 neurons. So what that means is there's 3 to 5,000 cells at this point firing. It's a unique pattern across 3 to 5,000 cells. Yeah, so you want to get the, you know, the capacity issue and say, what's the ultimate capacity of the campus? Well, you say it's 100,000 to 5,000, which is, <laughs> that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big number. <laughs> so that's the, but if you think about that pattern, three to 5,000, so the first time you go, you see some cells firing. The second time you go through, you know, the question is how consistent do you see that that three to five thousand cell vector, three to five thousand cell vector, uh, uh, being engaged on a moment to moment basis? Now we have to define what is moment. What's a moment in the case of the hippocampus? Well, we'll see, as a moment is in fact a very well defined uh, time scale, it's about a hundred milliseconds. As the there's clock or the primary rhythm within the hippocampus. No, it's the theta rhythm, something that paces activity and also segregates it into these 100 millisecond windows. And so if you compute the overall covariance across 100 millisecond, adjacent 100 millisecond cycles, the covariance is going to give you an estimate, actually a pretty reasonable estimate, of relative novelty or familiarity. And as I can tell, you just, again, it's like I do this, I'm the blind observer. You just take the spike patterns. I could just walk through these spike patterns if I had the dynamics as well. I could say, oh, by looking at covariance across adjacent fins, there's a lot of consistency. Animal must have been in this place before. This is, in fact, I could probably estimate how many times. Ah, the animal's been in this environment ah, seven times. So by looking, if I had enough, if I could sample from enough, I could estimate both the relative novelty and familiarity, possibly something about the uh, sort of the you know the temporal distance. That is the relative familiar familiarity. How long ago did it actually occur? Just by looking at the statistics of correlation across the cells, without even knowing what I don't even know what they represent at this point. Just say, look, they they tend to fire pretty consistently. Animals got to be familiar with it. Or there's a lot of variability. This must be something new. And so if you're a downstream structure, and there are a lot of downstream structures that need to be able to detect novelty, you say, well, how could they detect novelty? Well, one thing you say, well, they detect novelty by doing what I did. I walked by, I remember the kid, there's that little half, whatever that trinket stand is there. I don't remember seeing that trinket stand. And so it's very specific, very specific detection of novelty. And as I say, this was different from that. Now, maybe I'm a downstream structure, and that's, that's how I figure out 
something has changed. But there are other structures, in particular, a lot of sort of general neuromodulatory structures. They don't have a lot of neurons. They, you know, they have to they have to regulate broad state. And as arousal, they have to direct attention. How do I direct attention to something? How do I direct my attention to that little hat stand that I didn't recognize? Well, you say, well, first I notice it's a hat stand that I didn't recognize. So I direct attention to it. Well, <laughs> didn't you need to direct attention to it <laughs> in order to figure out it's a hat stand that you didn't recognize? So there's something. So something nonspecific said, oh, you know, something changed. Something has changed. And that, so the signal of change could be something like a covariance signal. The campus says, man, this just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't line up. I don't know what it is, but let's direct attentional resources to figure out precisely what the nature of that is. So, again, this, the, the use of nonspecific, uh, like novelty or familiarity signals that could be derived from simple, for instance, covariance measures, I think is probably a general strategy that's used to uh, identify and direct resources in this sort of, uh, um, sort of memory to perception based computation. Other questions? That was a good question. The novelty, you know, how, do, how many times? And so, yeah, the difference between one, two, three, five, it's in the relative firing rate, relative firing rate. Also. The location, though, that tends to be, you know, once you've seen it, first time through, that's where it tends to stick. And the thing that changes, again, it's the firing rate. Firing rate indicating some the non-stationarity that comes from different degrees of relative experience. What do you keep the actual shape of the spatial tank? Yeah, so now you say, oh, okay, I'm going to, you know, get this great little toy, I can start playing games, I'll start changing the cues, I can start doing things to, you know, to see what actually drives these cells. And so what you find is the changes to an environment that don't change, you could say, the animal's cognitive sense of place, rearranging the furniture, changing cues, they cause change in activity where what's referred to as rate remapping in the current nomenclature, that is it changes the relative firing of these cells. Uh, global rat remapping as change in the location of the place fields generally only comes when you actually physically change the environment. Or it also can come when you change the behavior in a given environment. So doing different things in a common space, you can say that is actually a determinant what we tend to think of as context. So if you think about context, that thing that allows us to recognize you know, the consistency across repeated presentations, sometimes referred to as reference memory. It's the, same, the, the kind of memory I can refer back to and say, yes, this is the same as it was yesterday and the day before. That constancy is not only defined based upon cue configurations, that is recognition that everything is the same, it's also recognition that I'm going to do the same thing in that environment. So changing the behavior in, this, in a similar environment will induce a global remapping, a change in the actual firing probability of function location. Again, this directionality is, is the most straightforward demonstration of that. And that is that the cell, that the, if you think about the, again, you think about these vectors, which cells fire at this location? Which cells fire at this location? Those patterns will change based upon the animal's behavior. If he starts going back and forth and these, again, in these, in these uh, sort of repetitive independent trajectories, then the patterns come into pen. Other examples of that, if an animal follows, uh, it's like if it's like you get to an intersect, like you're driving home, there's two ways you can go. You can go right and go left. Right gets you to the 7-Eleven, left gets you to, uh, I don't know where you go to, it's the Starbucks, right? So, so you can think of your context. The context could be, um, you know, oh, uh, I want a, you know, I want a big gulp. I'm really thirsty. So now the context is okay, go right. So you, what will happen is you have a different set of hippocampal cells that fire based upon the context, which is, you know, you're thirsty, you want to satisfy your thirst, and so you'll see place cells that will differ along that right bird trajectory. On the other hand, another context might be going, wow, oh, I'm really tired. I, you know, I stayed up all night. I did. I, you know, I have to drive on the cape. I need a coffee. And I really do need a coffee. Man, I could use a coffee like, you know, my coffee place cells are really going on. So you get different. So the behavioral demands could dictate 
you could say, an important determinant of context, and those are reflected in, again, global remapping, change of the activity in hippocampal cells, which tells you hippocampus is not just about remembering things. It's remembering things that are going to have important causal consequences, that is, the need to be able to predict or guide future behavior that might be independent. So if I need to do different things, then I need to represent things independently so that I can actually establish that link. So uh, creating different behavioral contexts can, can change the these can't themselves in this global remapping sense. Right. Yeah. When you change the environment, the topology keeps the same. If I just make changes to the environment that don't influence the behavior and don't change the, you know, fool the animal into thinking it's a different space. So being in a different, an actual different space, like moving to another room, you said, that's like an automatic. If, if I am someplace different, then I'm going to have to do different things. I'm going to, you know, it is it automatically, you'd say, becomes a different behavioral context. Now, I can play these games where I make, I use the same, you know, I change the room, but I make the, I make the maze the same. And what you find is that the hippocampal cells can actually map into these embedded reference frames. That is, that there's going to be a reference frame for the maze. So I can take this maze, for instance, and shift it. I can move it within the room. It's like you're sitting at your table, and I just move the, you know, I'm, you know, I take back, and so I just shift this table back, all right? And I ask, what are his play cells going to be doing? Well, you say, well, you know, back now he has to simultaneously know I'm still in my same spot. I'm still sitting here in front of my computer. That context has not changed. But I'm also in a different place in the room. And we all have that. I know where I am. I'm in the front of this room, but I also know I'm in the candle house, and I know I'm in MBL. So I have this, this notion of nested spatial reference frames. And the hippocampal cells will do the same thing. That is, a fraction of the cells are bound to different elements of these nested reference frames which, you know, in part uh, helps us to at least begin to try to understand why you need three to 5,000, why do you need three to 5,000 cells to fire in that one spot? When in fact, if you actually do the, you crunch the numbers, being able to decode an optimal decoder can uh, decode position down to the finest resolution, that is the psychophysical resolution of the animals, which in the case of rats, is about two centimeters. That's so why I put, if I have like a, if I, you know, in a large room, I have a little, bunch of little holes and I hide food in these little holes. I figure out, well, how close can I put these holes and, and the animal can still remember, oh, it's in that hole versus that hole. And the answer is two centimeters, two centimeter holes. Uh, I can decode that resolution about 100 cells. 100, cell, 100 place cells to fire this way it gives me two centimeter resolution at 100 millisecond time scale. So again, that's the behavioral, the, the sort of the computational window of integration. So essentially, all the infra, if that's all the hippocampus is doing, just trying to commute, convey information about where the animal is, 100 cells should be enough. But I got three to 5,000. So what am I doing with all of those other cells? Well, one thing is you say, well, it's not just static recognition, but there's this null nested thing, and that is that if I shift, you know, so some allocation of those might be to these nested reference frames. And the other thing is, there are things that are going to be changed. The non stationarities experience itself is bound to not just the kind of experience itself and the time varying nature of it is bound to the different, these different reference frames. And that if there's going to be a different experiential time scale to the different context, there's the experiential time scale of Say my talk, very fine, you know, granularity, you know, and so you can say that's being that's being captured at one resolution. But then at the same time, there's also the resolution of, uh, of a say longer time scale experience or experience walking into space. The there are the you know the, the things that are going on at different time scales, and so you can think of those events that are going on at different time scales also mapping into different you want to think of them as kind of segregated or modular subsets of neurons. So given that, different experiential time scales, different spatial time scales and refer nested reference frame, you can see how you might want to split these things up, break up the, break up the populations. Now, uh, I'll just leave this as kind of an exercise. I haven't really gotten interesting stuff. This is just the, this is the, that's why I didn't put in more slides. I knew I would never get all that. 
where you think about, okay, if I wanted to actually, if I needed to simultaneously, right, I needed to simultaneously to represent all that stuff. So you think I've got this vector, it's got all this stuff in it. It's got the nested reference frames, it's got different experiential time scales. But now I need to be able to pull that out. How do I pull that out? How do I tap that, the different components of this, of all these embedded representations? What would be a strategy? Just think, you can think about like communication channels. How would you actually do it? Sorry. Well, just think about it. So there are really kind of two strategies. One is like space and time. I could just identify those like the labeled lines. I say, well, I group them together. I say, these are the, right? These are the local, these are the remote. This is the, you know, fine time scale. This is the coarse time scale. And that's got it. I could segregate them and I can identify them based on the location. Another strategy, clever strategy in my mind, uh, is you could do it in time. That is, you use the ability to segregate activity in time. You use what's called phase coding. So you do phase segregation, and you use differences in per phase to, you know, potentially uh, uh, tag, or segregate different populations. Now, the beauty of that is that phase or relative timing is something that can be dynamically adjusted. Anatomy, that's kind of fixed. So again, I, you know, somatotopy of my body surface, I can't change that. That's, that's like hardwired. But I might be able to change dynamically if something, let's say, I started, you know, I, don't know, I have a tick and I start, you know, kept scratching my head, you know, making a, establishing a relationship to my head and my hand, something that, that I could establish if I had some control of the timing, head and hand, different phase, and I could just simply align these phases. Or, the preferred strategy, I just distribute the phases, I distribute all of that stuff, and then downstream I have something that selects out, say, okay, I'm going to bring together head phase and hand phase. So using phase, using relative timing as a way of establishing dynamic connectivity. Certainly it's, it's, a, it's a topic that's enjoyed a lot of uh, current uh, uh, computational attention and as a role for oscillations. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some data that, that points out how these dynamics and oscillations further serve uh, uh, to... Uh, confer upon the campus the ability to encode information over time. So it uses a computational tool, both for encoding and for uh, uh, dynamic retrieval, like pulling out things from the phase, from the notes, putting them in the phase, and then pulling them out from the phase. Um, sorry, what's our 10, 20, is that our? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So I'm just going to put so this is the play cells. This is a little movie. You don't need to see this movie. This is just showing what I showed you before. Oh. Okay. Uh, I think I will show you. Not this one. I will show you this. So you see those raw, you know, the. I'll tell you those, the, the raw play cells. So this is the activity. Um, That's sound, you know what it sound. But if you did hear the sound. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could. So if you could hear the sound, you would be able to hear some modulation. It's a rhythmic modulation to the there you go. So what you're seeing over here, this is the raw activity. This is what I showed you before. This is the individual spikes mapped into this amplitude space, that's just the amplitude of the action potentials that gives you a sense of where the unit sources are coming from. Can you hear that, can you hear that kind of rhythm? Kind of a ch -ch 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 like, it's like really strong, are you deaf? Uh, it's something that you really pick up. I mean, with experience, it just immediately, it just immediately jumps out. Now that rhythm is expressed when animals are moving. So I can tell animals moving, he's running right now, and then, when he, as soon as he stops, the rhythm will go away, and it's replaced by this kind of bursting activity. So you can tell what the animal is doing just based upon brain dynamics. Uh, and what I'm showing you there, so you're seeing the raw activity here. What we were doing here is we were just doing a simple Bayesian decoding. So you know, we map out the place fields. So we get you know get our place fields, our posterior estimates, and we just go through. And on um, uh, about a hundred millisecond time scale, 
we just estimate the likely location that the animal will have to be in order to see pattern of activity that we see in that, in that given time bin. And the triangles reflect the probability estimate. Larger the triangle, higher the likelihood that the animal is actually in that location. So you see it tracks the animal pretty well when the animal is actually running. When the animal stops, though, something else happens. Just, see, he's not running. But, So you see it tracks the animal pretty well. When he stops though, triangle goes away and you see the, I mean the, ceases to reflect the animal's current location. And now the estimate jumps all over the maze, which tells us the pattern that's being expressed is, core, is a pattern that was correlated with different locations. So you see, jump all the way back. You'll see later when we actually. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I remember um, there was some, some other work that I think you did. Um, that interpreted that, that, that sort of stuff as, as like planning? Right. No, so, yeah, I'll get to that. It's, okay. So when you slow it down, what you're seeing is that it actually it's expressing sequences or trajectories, spatial trajectories, both in forward and reverse direction, a long path that the animal has taken, the animal could take. And so the question is, is it reflecting on previous paths, or is it, uh, is it trying to extrapolate future uh, paths? And we'll see that it can be a little bit of both. Questions? I have a quick question with respect to the idea that they're using basically phase to pick out information. Well, in this case, this is just a simple Bayesian estimator basis. So we're taking, there's no phase information taken there other than we're taking time bins that, uh, that span what I'll show you is of a, a, a period of this fundamental rhythm, 10 hertz rhythm. But so, but so a combination between the theta rhythm and firing rate gives you Finer discrimination in terms of spatial location. Of the no, that's exactly what you think, and you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll show you this. And this is a lot of phase information. In fact, when John O'Keefe in the early 1990s, as I'll show you, uh, discovered another property of hippocampal play cells, and not only that they fire as a function of location, animal's direction, and are modulated by this rhythm, but there's a phase dependency, and that is that depending on on where the animal is relative. In a, in a relative to the, the place field, that is distance within the field is actually encoded as a difference in phase in terms of phase precession. So phase actually gives you a lot of information about location. So what he argued was phase is what you should be decoding. Phase tells you where the animal is. Firing rate gives you some other information. My question would be though, is if, if phase is using to basically differentiate out different aspects of a scene, but it's already used to encode spatial position, and spatial position is not necessarily always correlated time-wise, how do you then Decouple that. Yeah, you're right. So, right. So, you say, oh, there's a lot of spatial information in the phase. So, phase is space. But if you have all these other things that you want to use it for, isn't that a problem? Well, when we, uh, so we went in and actually using, using this GLM approach that is a sort of model based statistics that allows us to include everything. So, we include a phase term, we include a position term, and we just ask, how well does a spatial decoder do? If we include all this information, you would think, gee, phase should be, you know, that should really boost things up. That should give you the most information. Phase actually gave us a very modest bump in the overall decoding power. And one of the reasons is, as I mentioned, 100 neurons already got pretty much all the information I need. Yes, sir, phase gives you a little bit more. It's like, you know, it's, uh, there's a big jump going from, you know, SD to HD, right? SD TV looks like crap. HD looks pretty good. But, you know, like, you know, HD to 4K, it's too much resolution. You can't even see. If I put that up here, you wouldn't even be able to see it, right? You're too far. There's more information that you actually need. It doesn't add very much. And so you say, that's really the difference. Going, you know, the, <clears throat> um, the spatial fire, spatial firing properties, a small number of neurons gives us as much information. So what's this other information? But wouldn't that's you captured in phase? phase to decorrelate from spatial position if it's being used for another? It does, but as we'll see, the systematic variation, and that's if, in fact, they were independent. If they were like an independent phase, you know, you just, you're trying to spread things out in phase, sort of maximally orthogonalize activity, right? That's, you know, to increase, you know, increase information. You could do that. But what you find is that phase varies systematically. As I showed, the systematic variation phase of function of position, what that actually does is it confers the ability to encode trajectory or sequence. So what you have is, is within the theta cycle, you actually have two phase domains, one in which rate dominates, and that's where you could capture and reflect this kind of contextual information, another in which phase dominates, that's where you can capture sequence information. So it's like you have two, it's like you have two independent channels, it's like, you know, like television, you got your, 
got, you know, you've got your video and you've got your audio. You've got two different streams. They're captured the same, same stream, but you know, they're independently modular. You pull them out as needed. And so being able to do these two things, recognize, oh, I'm in, you know, I'm in the candle house and recognize that, oh, I did this or I heard that at the same time to have sequence memory and context memory together. One could pull out based on phase, on relative phase preference. So this is just a, yeah, I only got like 90% of the talk to go, that's okay. <laughs> so this is, uh, the, we'll get to the important stuff, which is this modulation, the rhythmic modulation as a function of locomotion. So when animals are interacting with the world, either moving through the world or intention, intentionally engaged, and that is the taking in information, Activity in the hippocampus, as well as in other structures, and we'll see, for instance, in you know, uh, the cortical areas and thick of the uh, prefrontal singular cortices, anything that talks to the hippocampus, you get this rhythm. And there's a phase locking that occurs. So the rhythm is something that occurs. And when structures need to communicate, they phase lock. When the animal stops, rhythm goes away and it's replaced by these kind of aperiodic bursts. These are called sharp wave ripples, sharp wave just because of the nature of the strong deflection in the electric field. Uh, and then when you look at activity of individual neurons, you find out lots of neurons, hippocampal cells are firing during sharp ripple events. But uh, this is what I was mentioning before. So if you look at, I uh, kind of zoom in, this is the rhythm, the theta rhythm. So the theta rhythm, it's a, it's a local field potential measurement. So you put the electrode in, you're looking at kind of population activity, where activity in this case is likely to reflect kind of integrated dendritic currents. So this is like the, this is like the integrated input that the neurons are receiving. The spikes are the output. And so if we look at the timing of individual spikes, so here's the hippocampal theta rhythm, and this is a single cell. If you look at the cell, as the animal begins to, as it begins to fire, you find that the cell fires at a particular phase here at the peak. Now, over time, as the animal moves, what happen is, happens is the firing rate increases, more spikes are emitted, and the relative phase or timing of the spike with respect to this theta oscillation changes. It shifts forward. And so now we can map the phase as a function of position. And when you do that, what you get is something that John O'Keefe had discovered in 1991. And that's the property of phase precession. That is, there's a systematic relationship between the position within the field. So these are all the spikes produced by one place cell. This is essentially its place field. If I kind of marginalize across phase and I just look at the firing probability number of spikes as a function of position, this gives me the place field. Two things you'll notice. One is that if I do that, that the place field itself is not symmetric. That most of the spikes are kind of bunched up here at the end. And this is actually asymmetric risk with respect to the direction of travel. This place field, the animal's moving from left to right, and I know that because of this, of this asymmetry and firing rate. And then also you notice that this is the phase within the theta rhythm. This is late, and this is early. So phase precession refers to the property that as the animal is moving through its place field, initially spikes fire late. You have to wait all the way to the late, you know, late in the theta cycle. And then as it moves through the field, the spikes begin to fire earlier and earlier. That's what happens earlier and earlier, so farther into the field, earlier in the spikes, more spikes, more phase variability. So think about this actually having two, the place field has two regions, there's two place fields, actually. There's the early part of the place field, and I just look at that part of the place field, you find here there's a very strong correlation, linear correlation between position and phase. This is if I were to do, if I wanted to decode position in this part, I say this is where I'm doing a lot of information. This, this part of it, this is lousy. I'm not getting it, you know. Bay's not giving much information. But this is where I'm getting the most, if I'm looking at firing probability, firing probability here is low, and as the firing rate, in firing rate, this is, in, this is summated over many laps. So the probability the cell spikes, fires a spike over here is relatively low here, it's relatively high. So anything that requires that I use firing probability, for instance, this relative familiarity. I thought relative familiarity requires that I look at relative covariance. I want to look at the, maybe I want to look at the relative firing rates as a function of time. So this portion of the field is given a lot of rate information. And so early and late field also segregates into early and late phase. And that is the, the latter portion of the phase, the theta cycle, 
This is carrying most of the temporal information. The early phase is giving me all this rate information. So it's really this early phase and a late phase, two different types of information. And a very simple model, my physical model, can actually account for all of this. And it's a simple excitability model. If we imagine as the animal's walking through the field, and in blue, you're seeing excitation. This is the input, the excitatory drive that the cell is receiving. And in red is inhibition. And inhibition is fluctuating, time-varying at the theta frequency. And if we simply ask, when is the spike going to be emitted, it's going to be when excitation exceeds inhibition, when the blue line is higher than the red line. So as an animal enters the field, so as excitation ramps up, you have to wait until inhibition drops all the way to here. So this gives us the early field, late phase. As excitation increases, cell can fire sooner and sooner. So it's a very simple principle. It's a stronger, stronger input, fire earlier, that's all. Weaker input, fire later. So it's just a magnitude to latency transformation. That magnitude to latency transformation gives you all of these properties. Gives you the phase shift. The probability of firing is going to be a function of the integrated time during which blue exceeds red, excitation. So there's more excitation, fire rate's going to be higher. There's going to be more phase variability. Yeah, and then I'll... So, so how is the velocity of the rat controlled uh, for in this kind of uh, phase plot? Yes, so velocity. So when John O'Keefe actually first, again, when he observed this phase procession, his conclusion was position is encoded in phase and velocity is encoded at rate. Now, <laughs> you could say, uh, you know, you can think about why would velocity be encoded in rate? One thing is that velocity, and that's the time spent, if you think about the number of, t number of cycles that are actually going to be occupied by a place field, as velocity increases, the number of cycles is less, so it's going to oversample the high firing probability regions. That's, so essentially, when the animals are moving very quickly, you're going to lose a lot of the temporal information. So you, the, 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 you know, the fidelity and resolution temporal information is going to drop. This is really largely unaffected by that. So you can, again, you can see how you would draw that conclusion. And maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's reasonable or accurate, a description. <laughs> Another thing that happens is uh, perhaps an effort to compensate the frequency, the frequency of the theta rhythm goes up. So there's a relationship, very, it's a relatively modest relationship between velocity and frequency. Uh, higher, fre higher running speed, higher frequency. Uh, so. Sorry, why is the excitation increasing? Why is that blue line going up? Oh, yeah, so why you say, so all this relies on this asymmetry, the ramping property of the excitation. So, uh, you know, this is something that Mike Mato, when he was in the lab, it, he, uh, he, he both uh, uh, sort of postulated and then empirically demonstrated, and that is that this is an experience dependent phenomena. That is that you can start with something that is not biased, but if you now bias the behavior and then you introduce a, an asymmetric like a plasticity or learning rule, you spike timing dependent plasticity. So if you spike timing dependent plasticity, which is temporally asymmetric, temporally asymmetric plasticity rule will give you a spatially asymmetric receptive field contingent upon the systematic behavior. So, systematic behavior. so when the animal runs from left to right, that asymmetry and timing will give you asymmetry in spatial field. So that's actually very important because what it says is this asymmetry is actually a reflection of behavior. You can't build that in until you know what the animal is actually doing. So the firing, again, you say the fire, where it fires, that is not a function of experience. That's just the random draw. Your hippocampus reaches in, throws out the 30%. And so this portion of it, you say, this is just the random draw. But getting the sequence down, the sequence is a product of experience. Asymmetry is a product of experience. The asymmetry is what gives you the phase, systematic phase encoding capabilities. So this is where, this is where experience, the time-dependent component of hippocampal memory rises it's in this fundamental property. Now, by extrapolation, you say, okay, if all of that relies on spike time-independent plasticity, you take that out, the whole thing goes in the, you know, in the can. That is, you should lose the ability to remember a particular aspect of hippocampally dependent memory. That is the experiential component. Static contextual recognition. So if you know like fear conditioning, that's what I would predict. You can do fear conditioning and it'll remember, I've been here before. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I've been here before. And then that could be conditioned to 
some downstream structure. But something that required explicit recall, navigational task, animal has to remember, oh, gee, where was the food, right? Food was over there, was it in that hole or was it in that hole? That's going to require some element of the time sequence memory. So just thinking that you could be able to dissociate these two components and then even test them uh, empirically and then back them back in some property of basic biophysics. And this basic biophysics, yeah, we're, not, we're already we passed. So <laughs> this is very interesting. I mentioned this very interesting phase, uh, uh, the idea that different phases, the different phase domains could be carrying different kinds of information. It could be like an encoding and retrieval. So you can think about this. Where's the encoding and where's the retrieval? If you were thinking about this, where's the encoding, where's the retrieval? Right, just using those terms very loosely. What might you point to? Uh, well, it's not clear that they would that, that you can map it specifically, but you can think about there being different kinds of demands here. And as the retrieval component, you say, look, the static context recognition. You think about it as recognition because it's formed one shot, right? You drop in, form it, it's done. I don't need any more, right? So rapid encoding, all I need to do now is I just need to retrieve this. Whereas this is constantly varying. This is the changing and firing rates. So there's going to be a constant encoding demand on this region of the phase space. And as I mentioned, the different inputs to the different brand, different dendritic regions have different phases and they're shifted by 180 degrees. So the different in, the inputs from the entorhinal cortex and CA3 map into these different phase regimes. So it gives you a very rich computational substrate for, you know, well, for doing interesting stuff relating to memory encoding, retrieval, context of sequence of experience, and uh, can't get into any of that. I, I just want to put this last thing up here, which is um, I didn't get into any of the data slides. But, uh, so if you take, take that basic principle, and as this is the basic principle, you make these things asymmetric, you have phase procession. Phase procession across in a single cell translates into sequence encoding across a population of cells. So this is what phase procession looks like in one cell. If I take two cells, place cell one in blue, place cell two in purple. Now what you see is that spatial adjacency, when he runs through here, activating place cell one and then place cell two on this behavioral time scale, which could be seconds, could be minutes, could be anything. This phase procession, phase transformation, means that in every cycle of the data cycle, place cell one will fire before place cell two, and the time will reflect the distance here, in this the actual distance. So you get this sequence or a trajectory compressed into this single hundred millisecond cycle, where you do two things. One is you transform this behavioral long and variable behavioral time scale into something that is short, biophysically appropriate for doing things like spike time independent plasticity, which is exactly what I had suggested, inferred the downstream asymmetry, which allowed you to encode sequence. So if somewhere downstream needed spikes to occur with the proper timing, in order for that structure to give you asymmetries or these ramps, this is what would give you the proper spike time. So it maps into something that's short, that is consistent, gets rid of the variability of behavioral time scale, Maps in by physical time scale. So, I, you know, I like to say is another is another general rule. So, general rules, things are organized They're like modules, dendritic modules, separate things in phase. And when you see ramps, anytime I see ramps, and there are ramps everywhere. You look in the brain, it's like everything's a ramp. It's ramps in the prefrontal cortex over time. It's, you know, ramps and gain fields and you know, and uh, you know, and you know, motion and high level visual processing ramps in the campus. There were ramps that were discovered actually before the discovery of place fields. Head fixed animals, just looking at basic conditioning, what you see over time, animals sitting there anticipating there's going to be a light, it's going to get a, you know, get some, some juice or something. What happens to the big amps? You get ramps. There's ramping activity over time. Ramps, when you have ramps, you can transform a ramp into these internal sequence representations using exactly the same simple strategy. This just says this ramp just happens to be one that's generated as a function position. I could change this anything I want and everything still applies. So I would think about that. When I see ramps, I think, oh, there's, there's sequences, there's sequence encoding, phase encode at work. Uh, so it's just 
with there. All right. And you do, in fact, see that. This just shows you, you actually do get the sequences. So that's the real representation in the hippocampus. Sequences, short sequences that go from just behind the animal, just in front of the animal, to the actual animal's position. These are these decoded, using this Bayesian decoder, decoded sequences from just behind the animal, just in front of the animal. 